Okay, so I think it's time to start and I want to welcome everyone who is joining us from different parts of the globe and different times. Uh, we very much appreciate your being with us and we're excited about our webinar, Christian Unity, What Difference Does It Make? Um, just a word of introduction, the webinar and the, um, the organization of it, along with the help from BWA leadership, comes out of the um, Commission on Baptist Doctrine and Christian Unity. And one of the goals of our commission is to lead Baptists in working towards unity in the body of Christ in the midst of our present challenges and opportunities. One of our uh, key passages, at least uh, a key passage for me, um, is from the Gospel of John and where Jesus prays for his disciples to the Father, that they may be completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to begin with a, a word of prayer. So let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and reflect on your call to unity. Guide and bless our conversation that it may redound to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so we are delighted to uh, have our five guests today. And uh, first, though, before I introduce them, uh, let me uh, introduce Valerie du uh, Duval. Pujol. Okay, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Valerie. Your um, French is fluent. Okay, <laughs> yeah, well, very, very little. <laughs> and um, and uh, Dr. Duval Pujol is the co-chair of the commission. So she will be uh, helping me um, uh, lead the webinar and very, very grateful so much for Valerie's wonderful input and assistance for this webinar. While I introduce our five guests, um, feel Please continue to enter in chat where you are from, and I think it's always a wonderful uh, blessing to see that as well. So I encourage everyone to continue doing that. Okay, so let me uh, introduce our, our five guests, and uh, our first is Dr. Frederick Digby, a minister in the Ghana Baptist Convention, has served as the senior pastor of Calvary Baptist Church since 1991. He was the general secretary of the Christian Council of Ghana and has participated in the BWA delegation for theological conversations with the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. So delighted to have Dr. Digby with us. Dr. Paul Fittis is the professor of systematic theology in the University of Oxford. He is also the principal emeritus of Regents Park College, Oxford, where uh, he is now a senior research fellow and directs an interfaith project for the study of love and religion. A Baptist minister since 1972, he is the ecumenical Prebendary at St. Delian Anglican Church in North Cornwall and Emeritus Canon of Christ Church Cathedral, Oxford. So welcome, Dr. Fittis. Dr. Glenroy Laylor is pastor of Bethel Baptist Church since 2018 and serves on the faculty at the United Theological College of Jamaica. He has been a member of the Standing Commission of the World Council of Churches Commission on Faith and Order since 2007. So welcome, Dr. Laylor. Dr. Nora Lozano, Mexican-born, is executive director and co-founder of the Christian Latina Leadership Institute, and she has been involved in Christian theological education for more than 25 years. She served as a member of the BWA delegation that held theological conversations with the Catholic Church, Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Lozano. And finally, Dr. Tomas Mackey was installed as president of the Baptist World Alliance in July 2020 and will continue his term till 2025. He served as dean of the International Baptist Theological Seminary in Buenos Aires, Argentina, 
from 1993 to 2004 and as professor since 17 I mean, since 1979 sorry not making you that old to us <laughs> he is a member of the bwa delegation for theological conversations with the Pontif pontifical council for promoting christian unity and is a founding and current member of the board of directors of the social ecumenical forum so we feel very uh delighted and also very privileged to have each of these speakers with us so each of them has been invited to address this question. What do you see as the challenges and benefits involved in ecumenical work? And we have asked them to give a five minute response to this question. While they are responding, if you have a comment or a question and would like to enter it into the uh, the lineup or whatever there is a q a box at the bottom of the screen so we encourage you to submit your questions and then we will be looking at these and bringing them in our discussion in the second half of the webinar okay so we will uh be starting in alphabetical order and i will then invite uh dr fred digby to give uh, the first response. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And thank you, participants. I uh, bring you greetings from Ghana. It's my delight to join this global family to share our experience of ecumenism. Uh, because there are other formal presentations, I will not seek to define any terms within my five minutes. I'll start with the benefits at first. When I, when I joined the, when I started noticing that the Christian Council of Ghana was working with the Baptists or the Baptists were working with the Christian Council of Ghana, I was curious because from most of our studies, uh, that didn't seem to be part of our tradition. But to cut a long story short, I found out exactly what happened. The Christian Council of Ghana used to be called the Christian Council of the Gold Coast and was formed on the 30th of October, 1929. It is one of the oldest ecumenical bodies in the world. It was formed among the traditional Presbyterian uh, Methodist churches since 1929. And there had been a strong voice in this country and came to prominence, particularly to, during the pre-independence Era. They joined the nationalists in fighting for independence. And finally, when Kwame Nkrumah got, uh, became independent, at first the church was an ally. Uh, he liked the church, but later on he didn't like the church because he started tickering with some of the things of the, in the Bible. For instance, uh, because he wanted to push the agenda for rapid development, uh, he promoted communism or socialism and the atheism. So the Beatitudes, he changed most of them. And you could hear people, the young pioneers recite things like, seek you first the political kingdom of Ghana and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, things like Nkrumah never dies and all of that. The church sought to remind him that he's mortal, he will die. He didn't need to antagonize the church that God is God. He got so furious that he closed down some churches. And at that time, the chairman of the Christian Council was a British Anglican, Bishop Lemaire, and he had him deported. And Nkrumah was pleasantly surprised that when he deported the Anglican Bishop, the white man, back to his country, Britain, as he thought, the churches from even Ghana, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Evangelical Presbyterians, all marched to the airport to see him off. It, it surprised him. Well, in less than a year, he brought the man back. It was at that time that the Baptists realized with our fiery evangelicalism and preaching and teaching and baptizing people, we better find a way of cooperating with others because if Nkrumah moved against us, we will be alone. In the Baptist high school at that time, they had started reciting pledges about Nkrumah being a hero, being a this and that. And all that the Baptist did was to pull out of the school, uh, the Sadler Academy, and it became Kumasi Academy. 
because of the political interference. So what were some of the things that we learned or the Baptist learned that brought them there? They learned about the power of having a common witness that we may be different from Anglican to Zion, but we can celebrate our unity in diversity. That became an obvious advantage for ecumenism. Then we also learned over the years, particularly when I was general secretary for about 10 years, that we can learn from the traditions of others, how we can learn and benefit from them. Sometimes the things that we do not do, uh, we don't do them because our church doesn't do them. It is not necessarily because they are not biblical. In our interaction with the Catholics, we see what they believe. We also see what we believe. But we also get to know that others believe in the Bible as well and may express it differently from us. But we are all bounded together. And that leads me to the third one. It helps us then try to seek to know what we believe and why we believe it. If we believe in baptism by immersion, why do we believe it? If we don't like why others baptize by sprinkling or putting a flag around their uh, necks, uh, heads, and we are all body, does it mean that we believe the same thing? No. So it helps us believe what, get to know what we believe and, and help us to explain better for ourselves and for our congregants and our communicants what we believe and why we believe it. Another one, the fourth one I see, is that ecumenism has helped us to seek support for each other in difficult times. Uh, I was on lockdown in the, the US as most people were locked down during the corona period. And there have been so many crises in our parts of the world. What has helped hold, help, hold the fort is the way churches have come together in partnership with other churches, other donor agencies, and even with the government in whether it is in the fight against HIV and AIDS, whether it is coronavirus or Ebola. And this partnership has helped us to achieve a lot. Sometimes we have natural, natural disaster happening in some other places and we banded together to help each other. One of the powerful forces in our country is what they call the local councils of churches, where apart from the national level, these churches in their communities have worked together to build community centers, uh, give a common witness, whether it is Easter or Christmas, they march together, they celebrate other things together. And the last but not the least for sake of time, is a common advocacy for taking biblical stance. Ghana is in the news now for better or for worse for the LGBTQ that is in parliament. And as you may know, the Christian community, I mean, even the Anglicans in Ghana, the Presbyterian, even the Methodists in Ghana, the, the Baptists, all of them are almost singing the same song that we are not for this. It would have been easy for one church to say, we don't like it and everybody marches against them. But with all these Catholics, Presby, Methodists marching and saying, we don't want this, at least it has opened the dialogue for all those who are for it to say, what, what is bringing all these diverse churches to say, we, we, we don't like this. Uh, it has taken even the Archbishop of Canterbury to write to Ghana. The Methodist Bishop has written to Ghana and they are arguing left and right. The, the churches in Ghana and the traditional authorities say no. So let's talk. So these have seen have been seen to be some of the benefits of ecumenism in terms of advocacy and working together. Now some thank of the you. challenges. Thank you, Dr. Digby. Thank you so much for your passion you. for ecumenism. We know All it right. was a huge, huge challenge to ask people like you, expert and passionate about ecumenism, to share in five minutes. But you will have more time in the question and answers to uh, keep on explaining maybe the other challenges and, and benefits. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Digby. Thank you. So Thank please, you. now with alphabetical order, we will now turn to um, the UK with Dr. Paul Fidis and five minutes as well. Well, greetings to everyone. And I've been asked what I see as the challenges and the benefits involved in ecumenical work. 
Over the years, I've been involved in conversations between the Baptist World Alliance and the Anglican Communion, the Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarchate, and the Roman Catholic Church, as well as regional conversations in the UK. So I want to confine my comments on ecumenical work, which is very wide ranging, but to confine it to these conversations. And the greatest challenge has been to answer the question, whom am I representing? Uh, we Baptists don't have a set of historical or official documents to which we can appeal to say, this is the Baptist position. We do, of course, have Baptist confessions of faith from the past and the present, going back to the early 1600s. But the early confessions are no longer binding on local congregations, if they ever were. Some conventions in modern times have confessions of faith that local congregations are required to observe, but these are regional. They don't carry a universal authority. And there are very valuable statements made by the Baptist World Alliance, often formulated at its annual meetings or congresses when representative Baptists have gathered from throughout the world. I think these carry a lot of weight, more than we often think, but they're not finally binding on national conventions or unions, certainly not on the local church. Baptists are a very diverse community, and so it's hard to respond when our conversation partners ask us, is that really a Baptist position? Whom are you speaking for? Sometimes in conversation, we have to say, some Baptists think this, others that, or most Baptists think this, but there are those who take a different view. But my experience of traveling widely among Baptists in all parts of the world is that there is a recognizable Baptist way of being a Christian and that we feel this sameness even in the midst of our diversity. We do feel at home with each other. It's about seeking for the mind of Christ together. It's a shared belief that baptism into the triune God is best expressed normatively in the baptism of a believing disciple. Historical confessions and BWA statements are certainly then worth quoting in our conversations because they illustrate, they exemplify this Baptist way. The challenge, I think, is redoubled when it comes to reception of the reports of conversations that have been held with other churches. It's very easy for national conventions and local churches to ignore the results. But they're hugely important for getting a vision of the Church of Christ universal. I mean for seeing how Christ is at work in other Christian communions. And they're invaluable documents, I think, for teaching the faith today. They help us to understand what the gospel we proclaim is even who Christ is for us today. And so I'm tackling the second question, what are the benefits? As I've indicated, the benefit is enlarging our vision of the presence of Christ in his church, of learning what it means to share in the mission of God in the world. It's easy to think that because we are the body of Christ, we're alone and exclusively his body and to forget that Christ is free to embody himself and to make himself visible in many different communities. It's easy to begin to think that we own mission, that mission is a Baptist mission to grow our churches instead of the mission of God to transform human life and to make it flourish. Ecumenical conversations give us a jolt they break open our self-enclosed views. It's essential to see how the mission of God is working out in churches quite different from our own, in places and cultures different from us. Only then will we really understand what the mission of God means in our own time and location. And that in turn means that we realize the necessity for working together with others in other Christian churches. But then that's a kind of ecumenical work that I hope and I know others will be talking about. 
thank you. <laughs> thank you, Paul. And even you didn't need any ring. <laughs> so thank you <laughs> for that. What a challenge and diversity to work with other Christians. Thank you for that. We will now turn to Jamaica to hear Glenn Roy Lelo. What he thinks are the challenges and benefits from being, working, praying with other Christians. Glenn Roy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I would like to employ the Baptist fondness for testimonies to share the factors that shaped my conviction and commitment to the task of ecumenism, of church unity, and in so doing, uh, hoping it will reveal the benefits that I and those of us who serve in this area are deriving. In rural Jamaica, where I had my early Christian formation, we lived what I was later able to describe as grassroots ecumenism. That is a natural unity and cooperation among churches and Christians in a particular geographical location. It was normal for Christians to worship at one denomination in the morning where they were members and to which they were committed and to participate in another at another time, the evening or at another time. This was also true for children attending two or more Sunday schools on a weekend or up to four vacation Bible schools during summer vacation. My ministerial formation took place in an ecumenical setting where my colleagues and classmates at the time when I was attending were Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Disciples of Christ, Congregationalists, and they later became one denomination, Lutherans, Ethiopian Orthodox, and a few Pentecostals. And the lecturers reflected a similar kind of variety. We appreciated and even cherished our denominational home as Baptist, as Methodist, as Anglicans, and we cherished our distinctives. And we argued vigorously for and against with each other. But this was never seen as a barrier that prevented us from respecting each other and from working together. As a young pastor serving in another setting in rural Jamaica, I recall very clearly having one of an early meeting with the church leaders in one congregation and hearing them objecting to us agreeing to have a particular event on a particular day. And the response would be something like, no, we can't have it on that day because the Anglicans are having their special service and we would like to attend. Or no, not that day, that is for the gospel assembly our day would normally be the other Sunday. So pastors and church leaders learned to cooperate even on the calendar of events to ensure that wide cross-denominational participation that gave evidence to the common witness of the church was available to the community. I learned that there was a natural way to be church. That is to say, working together was a natural way to be church. That differences in worship, and differences in theological orientation were understood and they were acknowledged, but they were also accepted. It was not seen as a disqualifier or a barrier to unity and or authentic relationships. The ministers fraternal in the parish in which I shared had an annual event where every, all the Holy Week served, each Holy Week, all the churches would come together and would worship together, presenting this common witness to the community. And how I remember us sharing in the Holy Communion together on Holy Thursday night. We were from very early exposed to the idea that our local church, our denomination was not the whole church. Ecumenism, it presents us with a glimpse of the authentic church a reflection of the Catholicity, the wholeness of the universal nature of the church triumphant, where people from all nations, every tribe and tongue are gathered by the spirit to worship God through Christ. It reminds us and presents us, reminds us of the fact that we are called to be witnesses 
And through the ecumenical pursuit, the church gives visible witness to the hope of God's unification of all things in Christ through the spirit. The church united, as someone once said, is a pilot project of the kingdom of God. Our understanding of John 17 is that without this ecumenical pursuit, the mission of God is being impaired, hampered by the church. That mission and unity are both at the heart of how we see the calling of God's people. Unity, koinonia, is also the goal of mission. Mission then, in my understanding, is not one option available to the church for us to seek and to derive benefits from. It is a missional imperative. That understanding keeps me as a Baptist and us as Baptists in Jamaica committed to the task of ecumenism. What's the major challenge? I list just one major challenge. The major challenge I think we face is to continue to perpetuate the inherited divisions formed in another time, and in our case, in another place that we work so hard to maintain. But I am confident that by God's grace, the prayer of Jesus in John 17 will be answered. Thank you, thank you, by God's grace. And thank you for reminding us of this triumphant church. We could almost picture it whilst you were telling about it, the triumphant church. Thank you so much, Glen Roy. We're gonna now turn to a Mexican accent with another female Baptist theologian. So welcome, Noah. We listen to you now and to what you think are the challenges and the benefits of meeting with other Christians. Noah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, so I'm honored to participate in this webinar with this distinguished group of colleagues. And I would like to start by sharing first about the benefits of being involved in ecumenical work. And then I will address some of the challenges. Uh, and it has been mentioned before, the prayer in John 17, where Jesus prayed for all his disciples of all times. He prayed for our unity. Uh, verse uh, 21 mentions that they may all be one. As your father are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So the first benefit that I see of ecumenical work is that we will find ourselves following Jesus' will. Many times we sing at home and in churches that we want to do uh, Jesus' will. So being involved in ecumenical work is one way to do that, to, to, um, to follow Jesus' will. Second, uh, Jesus linked this unity of the believers to the evangelistic mission of the church. In this prayer, Jesus introduces the unity of the believers as a prerequisite of effective evangelism, that they may be all one, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I'm originally from Mexico, but I have lived in the United States of America for most of my adult life. And in the particular time where I live, there's churches, there seems to be churches in every single corner of different denominations. Uh, San Antonio is a city where we find many of the challenges that Christianity faces today, secularism, apathy towards Christianity, uh, often a poor testimony among Christians. So if I'm a non-believer, I'm invited to go to a church, but I see that people are always fighting among themselves. Why should I go to this church? I seem to be more peaceful and find my lo more love in my house than in this church where Christians are fighting all the time. So that becomes a problem. So uh, ecumenical work helps us to be better Christians and helps us to, uh, in the, to fulfill the mission of the church. And third, doing work with our brothers and sisters of other denominations is a great way to join the help in the needs of our communities, local and global. We can do a lot more together. Regarding the challenges of being involved in ecumenical work, I see also three challenges. And again, when I speak about these challenges, I'm speaking from my corner of the world and what I have observed both in Mexico, Latin America, and in the south, southwest part of the United States of America. The first challenge 
I think it continues to be one of semantics of meaning. There is a mi misunderstanding of the word ecumenism and in consequence, a misunderstanding of the work of the of ecumenical work. Some Baptists in the area where I live and work see these words as something bad and negative. Some still believe that it means going back to be under the Roman Catholic Church. The second challenge that I see is basically who draws the circle and who belongs in the circle and who's outside of the circle. I'm referring here specifically to our Baptist brothers and sisters in many places of the world who still believe that Catholics are not part of the circle of Christians. Uh, and some of you may be thinking, how is that possible? How can someone believe that? Well, as human beings, we all live in a particular historical context. And in my experience in places where Catholicism is the predominant religion and Protestants have suffered religious persecution due to this pervasive Catholicism, these Protestants have a hard time seeing Catholics as part of the circle. So as members of the BWA and specifically of this commission of Baptist doctrine and Christian unity, we need to pay attention to the history and context of each of the different Baptist unions that we serve and be sensitive to their experiences and reality. Once we do that, we can start thinking about contextual ways in which we can move forward the ecumenical work. And the last challenge that I want to mention is the possibility that as I or we move to support the ecumenical movement, I or we may be getting closer to other Christian bodies, but creating division and disunity within our Baptist family. So the issue is how do we move together as a Baptist global family in order to promote and support ecumenical work without causing divisions among ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noah, for your picture of the circle and from helping us to redefine the term ecumenism as well. We're going to have now our last speaker. And whilst we have the privilege of listening to our president, Thomas Mackey, I invite you to write your questions not in the chat box where we only say where we are, but in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you click on Q&A, you will have a box opening and you can type your question and we will take these questions and ask our experts are passionate about church unity to answer the question. So now, Mr. President Thomas Mackey, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth and Valerie. It's a privilege to be with you and uh, to be with our brothers and sisters from around uh, the world. The challenge for the ecumenical work is to share the will of Jesus to bring about the unity of his disciples. The challenge for ecumenical work is to join with other Christians in receiving the fruit of the triune God's care for unity. The challenge uh, for ecumenical work is to work together with other Christians to fulfill the will of Jesus to seek unity among us. Unity that must grow to be like the unity between the Father and the Son. The challenge for ecumenical work is that through the unity achieved by God and with the work of the believers, the world may believe. The challenge for the ecumenical work is to be a channel of God's attributes. For example, God's truth, God's holiness, God's glory, God's love. The challenge for ecumenical work is to overcome the difficulty and destruction that sin produces among Christians, among us. For example, the power struggle among them, among us, the selfishness of each one, the difficulty they have in forgiving and being forgiven, or the unwillingness to understand others 
and the speed with which they want to impose their ideas on others. The challenge for ecumenical work is that each Christian may be fertilized by the other. Again, may be fertilized by other or the other. The challenge for ecumenical work is, as Paul Murray says, that each tradition should focus on the self-critical question. What can we learn or receive with integrity from our various others in order to facilitate our own growth together into deepen community in Christ and the spirit? The challenge for ecumenical work is to place ourselves in the attitude of learning from the other and from that learning to strengthen our own tradition. The challenge for ecumenical work is to articulate non-divisive diversities, to bring them together into more integral and richer Christian communities. The challenge for ecumenical work is as Paul Phillips suggest, and I like that, to offer our own learned modifications. That is very deep and very good. The challenge for ecumenical work is to work together with other Christians to overcome common enemies. The challenge for ecumenical work is to get to know other confessions better and to overcome the fears and uh, rivalries that arise from ignorance. The challenge for ecumenical work is to share the mission of Christ. And finally, finally, in my list at the moment, of course, the challenge for ecumenical work is to expose ourselves together to the rhythm that the word of God makes of us, to the transformation and empowerment of the church that Jesus makes and to the empowerment that the Holy Spirit brings. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tomas, so much. We appreciate you and all of all of you for con your wonderful contributions. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, Valerie and I will lead off with some questions, but as uh, Valerie has also said, we will address your questions that you have placed in the Q&A. So feel free to continue to do that. Um, so I, you know, I just, there were a number of threads I saw throughout, um, but I was struck, um, Glenroy, by your description of Christians from different traditions coming together and worshiping during Holy Week. And I would like to hear you, uh, Glenroy, or the other panelists address what you see as um, challenges or opportunities for coming together as a worshiping body. Um, because it seems to me that the heart of ecumenism and unity lies in our ability to worship together. So what do you see as both opportunities for Baptists or also some challenges there for bringing our koinonia you know, together in a common worship? The one challenge I'm, I'm seeing is a lack of appreciation for the way that other persons, other denominations, other Christians worship. And a lack of understanding of the symbols, the images that are attendant to their way of worship. Mm -hmm. I think if we spend some time in conversation, trying to understand all of that, beginning for me, where ecumenism begins, is what I learned from my early formation, is at the level of relationships. So uh, I am not seeing that person as Baptist, as, as Methodist, but it's my neighbor, my friend. Uh, and when we start there, then with that level of understanding, 
we can have a conversation and through the conversation, we can develop common understanding that will allow us now to do what some of my other um, colleagues shared, uh, uh, benefit from the, the blessings of each other, enrich the worship. You know, I, I think people call it, some persons call it uh, receptive ecumenism. Yes, we can yeah, benefit yeah, from that. Yes, so that, that's, yeah. that's my understanding. Yes, very good. And it relates really to koinonia is already communion and, and relationship. So it's already yeah. extending that, even though it might not be fully embodied in worship. But yeah, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Glenroy. Okay, I think uh, Fred would like to speak. So yes, Fred, go ahead. Yeah, a few of us went for one of these global congresses and it was a setting for worship. And we were pleasantly surprised when it came to the communion that we we're given fruits to share, apples, oranges, grapes, and uh, I would say our Baptist blood just froze in us. Is that the definition of communion? We couldn't eat bread. We couldn't eat, I mean, we couldn't share the cup together to eat fruit. Mm -hmm. So it came to us as a shock and uh, we kept talking about it and we still talk about it once in a while. Okay. Mm. Oh. Yes, Valerie questions are starting to come and thank you for your questions and what we expected is happening uh, we all have questions from our own context so many of your questions come from specific context uh, so we will uh, um, take first questions that are maybe broadly that are for everybody um, like this one and and you will tell me in the panel in the speakers who wants to answer these questions how can we handle conflicts of interpretations of biblical concepts in ecumenical engagement? So you see this huge, large question. Mm -hmm. uh, who would like to say something about the connection between or difference of interpretation of the Bible and our ecumenical commitment? Paul, are you there? Um. I don't know from the question whether the person means conflicts among Baptists or <laughs> conflicts between Baptists and those from other churches, mm, mm. because often it's the same thing. I mean, you will find the same kind of difference of approach to understanding scripture among ourselves as you will do um, in, in talking with those from, from other Christian communions. And it's very instructive to see how they handle the same kind of conflicts within their own, their own thinking. It's not just us and them, it's seeing how we approach scripture among ourselves. Um, and uh, it, it, it helps a great deal, I think, if you, um, if, if you experience the way that other Christian communions also approach exactly the same kind of differences in interpretation of scripture. Um, so what we're trying to do is to live in scripture, to find ourselves in the world that the scripture gives us and to hear what God is saying to us when we live in that narrative, in that text, rather than simply um, bringing points against each other and living in that scripture and hearing what God has to say, we can live in that scripture with others in the very process of conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Dr. Noah Lazzano, there is a question for you, mm -hmm. and it's about the specific context of Latin America, where we know that the tensions is also there with the Catholic Church. And the question is, what would be some successful strategies for building better relations between Baptists and Catholics in a Latin American context? <clears throat> Basically, you know, one of the things that I want to mention is that we have to be aware, and maybe Thomas can speak a little bit about this also, that there's a risk in getting into these uh, kind of relationships, okay? Um, but we have to be sure that we are faithful to God in all this, okay? And when I'm saying risks, you may be ostracized from your community, 
And we have seen it, I'm not talking about 100 years ago, you know, I'm talking about very recent history where I have seen that happen uh, to, to pastors in Mexico. Uh, but I think trying to leave the gospel, trying to leave the gospel, um, I think in all this conversation of um, ecumenical work, I think uh, humility, recognizing that we can listen to each other, okay? Uh, staying faithful to uh, the doctrine, our doctrine. One of our panelists mentioned that, knowing what is our doctrine and knowing how far we can go without compromising our doctrine, I think is important. So, but, yeah. but we are there to share with the people, to be with the people, to follow this, uh, Jesus will basically. But, you know, when Jesus followed uh, the Father's will, he got into a lot of trouble. So we may get a little bit in trouble as we are doing this kind of work in context where the where Christianity is so polarized, basically. Mr. President, would you like to add something on this specific question? Yes, of course. There is a question there from Ricardo Salvatierra and Graciela Lampert. Hello, how are you to both of you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that when we meet each other, I mean, when we are in communion with other Christians, we are trying to respond what the world is asking us. We are in the world, we are the world. And our mission is for the world too. So there are many questions the world uh, is, is doing because the world in some way is suffering. For example, the extreme secularism is asking us, what is the role of Christians in the world? And the world is suffering because of injustice, of persecution, of hunger, and many other questions. So when we meet together, we are trying to respond to the question, which is the mission of the church? Uh, in fact, in our current conversation with the Catholics, that is the big topic, in which way we can unite with others because of the mission, in which way the, the needs of the world are uniting us to be like Jesus in this moment. And I think so that any question coming from the world in terms of politics, in terms of economy, in terms of the needs they have, it's part of the topic of our unity, I think so. Um, there is a question for Dr. Digby as well. Um, it would be, how do you start? It's a very concrete question. How do we begin when we want to start something like what, is hap what has happened in Ghana in your country? So how do you start? Where do you start, especially in a context where there are obstacles and difficulties. What would be your advice? One of the things I've experienced is that it takes prizes, pressure from outside to see brothers and sisters, there are more things that unite us as Christians than divide us. And somebody must be willing to take the lead. Mm. Somebody must be willing to provide some guidelines and there should be checks and balances. A very basic framework, but normally, like I said, crisis and difficult times seem to be what brings the church body together. To pray, particularly uh, sometimes elections or natural disasters or calamities or pandemics have sought to bring us all together. And somebody must be willing to take the lead and provide leadership. That's been my experience. Yes, thank you. And Glenn Roy, there is one for you. 
very specific, asking, can you share more about how you in Jamaica are able to debate and argue with great energy and mm. still call each other brother and sister? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question because <laughs> I think we, and, and I'm going back to my basic premise that it begins with relationship and that if we appreciate that within the region in which we live, there is a natural appreciation for diversity and an acceptance of diversity so that we, we, we can all agree on a concept, but not agree on the way that we approach or think and talk or even talk about, about the particular concept. So we begin with, with relationships. And what I found particularly helpful in the setting in which we were formed, the, the theological seminary, is that, okay, we are arguing now, but later on we are eating together, we are playing together, we are relating with each other, and we are getting to know each other. So Reverend Dr. Horace Russell was always clear to me on this matter that ecumenism at the heart of it is relationship, about relationship. And, and the command by Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. And to appreciate, and, and this is something that we have had to do in the Caribbean, that there is a political source to denominationalism and church division. Mm -hmm. The church came to our region as, a, as the bedfellow of colonialism. And it came to the region reflecting the divisions and the culture wars that existed in other parts of the world. It, it, we, we embraced it and we, and we continued it and we perhaps added a few of our own, but, but that is also an appreciation that sometimes when we're able to talk about it, we are able to do that. So the, the, the concern is not so much um, trying to work out the finer points of the theological issue, but how are we seeing the work of God and the call of God in the text that we are reading together. Hey, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Um, there's a common statement uh, from the 20th century uh, early on uh, that was ethics unites, doctrine divides, mm -hmm. and or sometimes it's service unites. And um, I just wonder if, if y'all could speak to that because I think that sometimes, yes, we definitely come together around human needs and wanting to serve but then we also have the doctor you know and so sometimes doctrine is cast to the side um but does anyone want to speak to that question because yeah i mean we are the uh, we are about baptist doctrine our commission is so we can't we can't go that route but <laughs> if i can say something um and it relates to what both of you were saying you know, one of the things that I feel that sometimes we get in trouble, I guess, is when we put the theologic, the practice of a theological principle at the level of the theological principle, okay? Like for instance, um, when we, we agree all about baptism, but how do we practice baptism? Okay, uh, when we put that practice, so how do we sing, how do we worship, what instruments we use, when we put that practice at the level of the theological principle, that's when we start getting in trouble, I think. So there has to be more freedom in that. And also what you were saying, Beth, uh, you know, freedom in helping, we are called to help each other, you know, in, mm -hmm. in all this ethical and especially when there's disasters, we cannot be asking about, you know, what do you believe? You know, and if you believe like me, I give you water or I give you whatever is needed in that disaster. Mm -hmm. We need to move beyond that. And, but, I, but I think many times we, as I was saying, you know, let's say in the issue of worshiping, uh, we put the instruments that we use at the level of the theological principle that we need to worship God. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Nora. Paul, did, I think your hand is up. Well, I just wanted to respond to your, your question yeah. about, um, about uh, doctrine and practice, rather as Nora has done, I think. Uh, there's a two-way movement here, isn't there? Of course, we engage in certain practices and work with others because of convictions we have theologically. But it does work the other way around as well, that by the very act of working together, we can ask what our doctrines mean. 
But for example, yes. when we're working in reconciliation, we can say, well, now what does this actually tell us about the saving work of Christ on the mm -hmm. cross? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they, they are in fact one and the same. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, or uh, what does this tell us about God as creator when we're working together for say mm -hmm. ecological justice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's all the time doing, I think, this um, reflective movement yes. of yeah, saying, yeah. now, in what we're actually doing, how does this help us to understand mm -hmm. the lordship of Christ in the world or mm -hmm. the power of the gospel? Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Paul. Yes, a whole, a whole cloth. OK, uh, Valerie, do you think we have time for one more question or? Yeah, maybe a final comment for president because okay, we yes, leave time yes, for okay. No, I saw. Yes, we want to leave time. I, and no, Tomas, no I did see your hand. No final. Yeah. No yeah. final, but yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> well, well, just to say that when we are meeting, let's say to discuss a word that I don't like too much, but let's say to discuss doctrine. We need to remember that we are human beings. So actually, when we are doing something, we are human beings. And the, import, the important thing is that our responsibility is to love the other, to care the other, to be well related to other or related to other as Jesus relate to him or to her. So more important than the final discussion of doctrine is in which way we have a better relationship to that person, to that mm -hmm. human being. Mm -hmm. And we need to represent Jesus in that relationship. Mm -hmm. So if when we are together with some other person, we are in such a way that Jesus is there because of that conversation, that is very important. Mm -hmm. Yes. We are discussing a doctrine or discussing a program or whatever. Mm -hmm. In fact, we need to look for Jesus to appear because of us in that communion, mm -hmm. in communion mm -hmm. with that person. Yes. And that's very important. Yes, very good. Thank you, Tomas. And it reminds me also of the work of the Holy Spirit and mm. that unity is a gift from God, first and foremost, um, and one we are called and invited to participate in. So it's not just our own efforts alone. <laughs> so, okay, uh, Valerie, did you have one more thing you wanted to, to introduce here? I want to say thank you to all the questions. In yes. fact, there were so many, we couldn't only answer a few, but yeah. maybe one of the last that has just arrived is not a question but a comment I want to leave to you before we have this final prayer together yeah. and this comment is a question aren't we pieces of a puzzle rather than theological adversaries mm. and it's exactly in the perspective that our president has shared we yes. we know that we need the others as well so yes. thank you for all your questions yes, and your yes. participation. yeah that's a wonderful wonderful image yes of the of needing the body of christ exactly of the different members of the body of christ i would like to thank uh all our panelists of course again for your participation and for leading us in reflection on this important topic that is really uh, so crucial to the Baptist World Alliance and to our local congregations and to our lives as Christians. So I very much appreciate that. And I also want to thank um, Everton Jackson um, for his leadership, who's the Director of Integral Mission, as well as Carolina Maggieri and Merritt Johnson who have done behind the scenes work in making these things possible. So uh, very much appreciate that. A recording of this will be available on the BWA website. Um, it will be attached, I think we will send out a notification, but uh, it will be linked to our commission on Baptist doctrine and Christian unity. <clears throat> so I would like for us to close now with a prayer and it's going to appear on the screen. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, and 
I invite you to say this with me as our closing here. God, eternal and merciful, you who are a God of peace, of love, of unity, we pray, Father, and beg you to gather through your Holy Spirit all that has been scattered, to unite and rejoin all that has been divided. Grant us also to convert to your unity, to look for your unique and eternal truth, and to abstain from all discord, so that we can be of one heart, one will, one understanding, one spirit, one reason and fully turn to Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can, Father, worship you as one and give you thanks through our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you again, all of you who have been able to join us. Um, we appreciate your time and your participation.